Good evening, everyone. Hope you're all doing well today. So good to see you all. My name is Sandeep Mazumda. I'm the Dean of the, the Business School here, the Hagamma School of Business at Baylor University, and it's my uh, privilege to get us kicked off for this evening. One of our priorities here at the Business School is to promote purposeful research and scholarship from a wide variety of areas and a wide variety of thinkers. And, and for that reason, I'm very excited to have our special guest speaker here tonight who's going to give us some of his thoughts on taxes and um, given his reputation and background, I think we have a lot, lot to learn and to look forward to this evening. Tonight's event is, is sponsored by the Bar Center uh, for Free Enterprise, uh, and it's done in conjunction with the Young America's Foundation. Baylor's Free Inter Enterprise Program was designed and purposed to promote research, teaching, and public outreach in the nature of free enterprise. And the forum, that, the forum series that we have, such as tonight's talk, is designed to bring in distinguished academics, policymakers, and people who are informing uh, uh, important uh, debates and key issues such as taxes that we'll hear about today, and to bring them into Baylor and for us to hear from them and have an opportunity to interact with them. For all of our audience and guests today, today I recommend that you go to the Hank Hammer School of Business website, look at the Center, Center for Free Enterprise, and uh, take a look at the schedule of events that we have. We have many other speakers coming up uh, including next month. <clears throat> we have a Confessions of an Entrepreneur series as well that I recommend, as well as some working papers from faculty that you can read. So uh, with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Jim Key, Clinical Assistant Professor in the Department of Entrepreneurship and Corporate in Intro Innovation, excuse me, who's going to tell us more about tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, little housekeeping. If you're a student, make sure you've scanned your card before you, before you leave. Um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Young Americans Foundation. Young Americans Foundation, if you don't know, is uh, probably the leading pro-freedom youth organization in the country. Its mission is to ensure an uh, increasing number of young Americans understand and are inspired by the ideas of individual freedom, a strong national defense, free enterprise, and traditional values. Um, in addition to hosting some of the premier advocates uh, for free enterprise, Young Americans Foundation also preserves the, uh, the Reagan Ranch in Santa Barbara, California, um, and uh, also the Reagan Boyhood Home in Dixon, Illinois. Um, so thank you a lot. They, they really uh, contributed both in, in time and money to bring Dr. Laffer here. Also, mark your calendar for our next free enterprise forum which is November 3rd, featuring John Henrik, Professor of Anthropology at Harvard University, for his talk, Weird Minds, How Religion and Family Shape Psychology, Democracy, and Innovation. So that brings us to our speaker, Dr. Arthur Laffer. I could read about 15 pages on Dr. Laffer's accomplishments, but he told me to keep it to about 15 seconds. Um, so real quickly, Dr. Laffer is a graduate of Yale University, PhD at Stanford. Um, widely known for triggering a worldwide tax cut movement, is regarded as the father of uh, uh, supply side economics. Um, he's co-authored over 20 books, uh, or authored over 20 books, was a member of President Ronald Reagan's Economic Policy Advisory Board for both of Reagan's terms, advisor to British Prime Minister uh, Margaret Thatcher, many others. He sits on the board of directors uh, or advisors of numerous public and private companies. Um, and in 19, 2019, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of um, Freedom, the highest civilian award in the country by President Donald Trump. I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that Dr. Laffer is um, easily one of the most influential economists that this country's ever produced. So without further ado, please help me welcome the man himself, Dr. Arthur Laffer. You don't have to, by the way. He, I promised I'd be short. Um, I've been short all my life, by the way. And when you talk about that, of the resume in 15 seconds, you remember? It's sort of like uh, putting the television in the microwave. You can watch 60 minutes and 30 seconds. No, oh, no. See, I'm just testing you to see how. You don't mind if I have a little fun with you tonight, do you? Is that all right? See, I want to start off as uh, just that I live economics. Not only do I write about it, but I live 
the talk, I walk the talk and talk the walk and do all that. And a number of years ago, I moved from California to Nashville, Tennessee. Now, can any of you guess why I moved from Nashville to <laughs> taxes? And I, I hope I'm not going way over your heads on this, but if you have two locations, A and B, if you raise taxes in B and you lower them in A, people, producers, and manufacturers are going to move from? I'm, I'm not going way over your heads on this. <laughs> I, I moved from California there, and we looked at Texas very closely, but uh, uh, the one thing I missed about California when I left was uh, I had been on the governor's council of economic advisors. It was a part-time thing. Of, Milton Friedman was on it, and George Schultz, and some of the others you know very well and there, and, and when he turned to the dark side, I left town. But I, you know, when he ran for governor, I had some really fun. You know Schwarzenegger. You know how he is. He asked me to come down to his house and spend a little time talking about policy. And I had heard from everyone that he had the sharpest wit in town and that you really had to prepare strong defenses uh, to be able to handle a conversation with him. So I prepared myself that the best defense is a really aggressive offense. OK? So I went and we sat out in his back patio. and. You know, he's got this type of guy. And I said, you know, Arnold, I can't believe it. You're running for governor, how great it is. It's just wonderful. And I was just over the moon when I heard your two advisors were Wilson and Buffett until I found out it wasn't Owen and Jimmy, but it was Pete and Warren. And I go, ah. And he looks at me and he goes, ha, ha, ha. He says, why is it also? All you clear-thinking economists are so short. Where does that come from? I mean, seriously. He said, Milton Friedman, he can't be more than four feet, six inches tall, little bitty tiny man. <laughs> and you also, you remind me of Donnie DeVito. You know, I starred with him in Twins. So that was my final story on leaving California. But what I want to do is take you into that, exactly the story of California and why I left. I wrote a book afterwards um, on states. It's called the wealth of states. And let me, if I can, take you through a little bit of the wealth of states, because it, it's a huge lesson. And you guys living here in Texas will really understand this story. You're the growth model of the world. You, Florida, Tennessee, uh, Nevada, uh, South Dakota, Wyoming, uh, and uh, New Hampshire. I mean, it is amazing how these states. And what I did was in this book uh, in 2014 is I looked at a different s s metrics on looking at states and economics from about a 30,000 foot perspective. The, the first chapter, which I'm gonna go through a little bit with you here, is called, uh, is called The Fall from Grace. Uh, and I'm gonna look at the 11 states that have introduced an income tax uh, since 1960. It's sort of cool if you look at those numbers. Uh, the second chapter was, uh, was called The Nine Members of the Lord of the Rings to Offset the Nine Nazgul. That was my grandchildren gave me that title. I really don't understand it, but that's what they gave me. It's the nine zero income tax states and how they perform relative to the nine highest tax states. In, in the book, there are a lot of econometrics and a lot of other stuff, but there's also uh, a whole thing I'm comparing California with Texas, which you might find fun if you look at just how well your state functions relative to California and where all the advantages come. But let me, if I can, start off with the 11 states that have introduced an income tax, the fall from grace. Now, the first state that did it since 1960 was West Virginia. West Virginia introduced an income tax in 1960. The latest state to do it was uh, Connecticut. Uh, Lowell Weicker, the governor of Connecticut, Yaley, I'm a Yaley. Uh, the governor of Connecticut was 1991. They put in an income tax. In between those two sort of bookends, uh, you have a lot of other states that have done it. Rhode Island put in income tax. Maine put in an income tax. Uh, I said Connecticut, but New Jersey put in income tax. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Nebraska, and I don't know if I've missed anyone in there, but 11 states have put in an income tax uh, since 1960. What I did was I went to each of these states and centered them on the year they put in the income tax. All right, each state was centered there, and I looked at five years before they put in the income tax, the five years before they did it, and the latest five years. So what I did was I looked at the five years before they put in the income tax, 
and I looked at the major economic metrics of the state. I looked at population, gross state product. I looked at uh, personal income. I even looked at tax revenues, all relative to the rest of the nation. So what I did was, let's say in Connecticut's case, I looked at the population of Connecticut before 19, five years before 1991, relative to the 39 states population. And then I looked at the last years, the five years, the la latest five years of Connecticut's population versus the 39 states to see how they moved relative. All 11 states, period, all centered on the year in which they introduced the income tax. You, you all follow me, what I'm doing? It's really very straightforward. Uh, very easy met metrics to look at. Every single one of those 11 states that introduced the income tax, every single one of them, not one exception, in every single metric declined relative to the rest of the nation. Every single one did. And not by a little bitty, bitty bit, but by huge amounts. Let, let me give you an example, and all by a huge amount. If you look at, let's say, Michigan. Michigan before Romney, by the way, this is Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, who was governor then. He introduced the income tax, I think, in 1967. They put in a separate corporate tax in Detroit. They put that in. In the five years before uh, they put in the income tax, Michigan was about 5.2% of the US population economy, all right? Today, they are about 2.7%. That is a catastrophic decline. Detroit, in 1950, had a population of 1.85 million. Today, Detroit's population is less than 600,000. As a kid, I, I was raised and grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I don't usually admit that, but I'm, I can do it in the crowd here today. My mom and dad, used to take me on a trip. I mean, the big vacation trip was to take a train ride to Detroit. If, if you think of it in today's terms, <laughs> you know, it's like picnicking at the garbage dump, but just joking. <laughs> but I mean, it's, I mean, the, the train station in Detroit in 1950, 55, w was the Taj Mahal. It was the Paris of North America. You have never seen such a catastrophic decline in, in your uh, mind size. Uh, my home state of Ohio, we put it in, Gilligan put it in in Ohio, who happened to be a Democrat. Romney was a Republican in Michigan. Ohio is just a collect. You go downtown Cleveland, Ohio, and you walk around, windows are broken, everything's like, and then all of a sudden you look at two beautiful, beautiful institutions sitting there, Cleveland State University and, uh, and the, and the uh, Cleveland Clinic, and there they are, these shiny, beautiful buildings in the middle of this, I mean, this wasteland, literally in this wasteland. And you ask, why are those so? They're all 501c3s, tax-exempt entities. It is amazing how tax-exempt entities thrive in high-tax environments. I mean, they really do. Uh, the one I want to get with you most of all is just, uh, is just an astounding example of what happens with tax policies. I I if you look at the state of New Jersey, all of you know the state of New Jersey, sitting there a little bit below Connecticut, New York, you know, there. In 1965, New Jersey had neither an income tax nor a sales tax, neither one. Fastest growing state in the nation. People from everywhere were moving into New Jersey and they had a balanced budget. Before, uh, before uh, uh, Chris Christie was governor, uh, the governor was named John Corzine. I, I have to tell you in full disclosure, John Corzine was the governor. Um, he was a student of mine at the University of Chicago, just in, Full disclosure, C student. <laughs> and, and after MF Global, I'm not even sure he earned the C, but they were the highest tax state sales tax, highest income tax, highest property tax, highest taxes on everything. The state was the slowest growing state in the nation. People from, were just leaving the state like rats out of a sinking ship and they had a huge budget deficit. You know, when you look at these states, it's just amazing the consequences that have occurred when you look at the institution of income tax and how that affects uh, people's behavior. Now, I sat back in the, in the book, I sat back and said, why on earth would people do this? I mean, if you're sitting there in the legislatures, you know, if you look at the legislatures here, you've got, let's say, each state has about, what, 80 counties? 
Uh, each county has maybe, maybe three or four uh, metropolitan areas, cities. Uh, you have data going back from the time of the beginning of time, and it's huge, voluminous data. And you ask yourself, why would anyone go ahead and introduce an income tax in these states? And you know, if you if you were a fly on the wall in the legislatures, you'd sit there and listen to the arguments on each side. There, there'd be people like me saying, "Don't put it in; it'll ruin your economic growth." And, and then there were a group of people the other side saying, "Look it, we need better schools, we need highways, uh, we need all these things." I mean, if you look at these states, some 50 to 55 percent of all state spending is on education, K through 12, uh, junior colleges, uh, colleges, universities. I mean, all of this, every state spends about 50 to 55 percent. And all of these legislators were arguing that we need higher taxes in order to get better public services. All, all of you follow me on this? So what I did was I took those 11 states. And again, I looked at all of them vis-a-vis -vis the year they introduced the income tax. And I tried to get a different metrics of what the results were from public services provided by the cities, counties, and states that it put in the income tax. Now, I, I've got a lot of measures in the book there on highways and police and all this, but the one I really want to go through with you here very quickly is because education is such an important measure of all of this. Uh, you can look at two ways of the measures. What are the inputs, the full-time equivalent employees in education? You can look at that, but you can also look at the results. And the Department of Education here in the United States does something like the does something called the NAEP scores, National Association of Educational Progress, which looks every four or five years at fourth grade reading and math and eighth grade reading and math. So what I did was I went back to each of these 11 states and looked at what their fourth grade reading and math was prior to the introduction of the income tax and eighth grade reading and math and then looked at what their test scores are today. If you look at those 11 states, two of those 11 states improved in their relative ranking in education by a, just a teeny tiny bit relative to the rest of the nation. Nine of those states declined. Three or four of them were just by declined by a little bit, but some of them just crashed there. When, when you look at this, they not only didn't get the economic growth, they didn't get the tax revenues, but they also did not get the improvement uh, in public services that were there. I mean, it really is an amazingly stark, clear story of that. My, my home state of Tennessee, we are the small, we are the, we the lowest tax state. This is why, by the way, moved from uh, Rancho Santa Fe, California to Nashville, Belmede, uh, Tennessee. Uh, we are the lowest tax state in the nation. We do not have an income tax. Uh, we don't, do not have an unearned income tax. We don't have a death tax. Uh, we don't have a gift tax. Uh, we have the third lowest property taxes, which is where we beat the heck out of Texas. Sorry about that, just thought I'd mention that. We are, if you measure all taxes as a share of GDP in the state, we are the lowest tax state in the nation. You with me? We have the largest budget surplus relative to our size of any state in the nation. What? We are the lowest tax state in the nation, the largest budget surplus, how does that happen? Not only do we have the largest budget surplus, but we have the highest credit rating of any state in the nation by all three credit rating agencies. We're tied with, with, five, with four other states, that highest rating. Our pension funds in Tennessee, our fifth highest ranked, we are fully funded states for all cities, counties, and local district pension funds in the state. If you look at it, we don't have New York City. We don't have the beaches of Florida. We don't have any of this fancy stuff there, which other people do. In fact, when I go back home tomorrow, I will have to re-put licorice on my teeth uh, to make sure that I'm allowed and accepted coming back into Tennessee. Just, just joking, just joking, I love Tennessee. The, uh, but I mean, when you look at it, the public services, our highways are, but the one I want to tell you about most of all in public services is education. In fourth grade reading, we have had the biggest improvement of any state in the nation, bar none. Fourth grade math, we have the biggest improvement of any state in the nation, bar none. Eighth grade math, eighth grade reading again, in both areas, we are the number one improvement of any state in the nation, period. We are the fastest growing state in the nation if you look at employment to population. We are the only state in the nation that literally attracts net income, adjusted gross income from Florida. 
It's a me. You know, when you look at this, incentives really, really matter. And in that book, and uh, if you look at the nine states with no income tax and compare them with the nine states with the highest income tax, it's incredible the discrepancies in the growth. And uh, I just wanted to go through that with you here. It's just so important, and especially when you look at policy and how to really get the types of things you want. Now, I also want to go through with you here uh, what I consider the most, one of the most important theorems in macroeconomics. And I, I'm, I'm going to go through it verbally with you, but it's the theorem of redistribution. And uh, it applies to the federal level, it applies to state and local levels, it applies everywhere. Now, redistribution occurs when you take from someone who has a little bit more and you give to someone who has a little bit less. You all with me? I mean, you follow that? It doesn't have to be more or less. Just when you take from one group and give to another group, that is redistributing income from the one group to the other group. But I'm going to use it a little bit more, a little bit less. You follow me? You with me? Now, if you take from someone who has a little bit more, that person will have less incentive to produce, and that person will produce a little bit less. Any questions? What you do is then is you take from that person who has a little bit more and you give to a person who has a little bit less. By giving to that person who has a little bit less, you provide that person with an alternative source of income other than working, and that person too will produce a little bit less. Any questions on that? This is math, people. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not liberal, it's not conservative, it's not left wing, it's not right, right wing, it's not tall, it's not short, it's not male, it's not, it's math. And it's math across all groups whatsoever. Whenever you redistribute income, you always reduce total income, period. Never forget that theorem. When you look at all of these big programs coming out of Washington, and then you look at the U.S. growth rates and how we're going into secular decline, you can understand exactly why that is. You, you follow me? I could say it in a little bit more. If you tax people who work, and you pay people who don't work, do I need to say the next sentence to you? Don't be surprised if you find a lot of people not working. You, you follow? And that, now, I want to go through the lemma of this theorem, and I'm not going to prove the lemma verbally, but I want to go through it with you because it's equally as important. Not only is it whenever you redistribute income, you always reduce total income, but the more you redistribute, the greater will be the decline in total income. You, you all see that intuitively clearly? The one I love most of all, the piquant flavor of this theorem, is the limit function of this theorem. And the limit function is absolutely delightful. I, I wish we had Bernie Sanders here and Elizabeth Warren, AOC, and some of the others. If you were able to redistribute all income so that everyone comes out exactly the same, if you were able to do that, there will be no income whatsoever. Let, let me go through it with you a little intuitively. In order to get everyone to come out exactly the same, what you have to do is you have to tax everyone who makes above the average income 100% of the excess. And if you have to subsidize everyone below the average income up to the average income in order to get everyone to come out exactly the same. Y you all with me? That's what you have to do to get everyone to have the same after tax come subsidy, exactly the same. Now, if you actually did that, if you actually taxed everyone who made above the average income 100% of the excess, and if you actually subsidize everyone below the average income up to the average income, I will stipulate today, Counselor, everyone will be exactly equal at zero income, period. This is the theorem of re And what I would suggest for all of you, and it's math, it's not politics, is when you look at all of these policies, this is the key theorem to evaluate and look at all of the policies you see coming out of Washington or your state capitals or wherever it is 
It's the redistribution. I, I used to describe it this way. I, when, when I taught the classes, I used to say, if I ran this class the way your government runs your country, what I would do is I'd flunk all the A students out, and I'd give all the F students scholarships. Now, don't giggle. Because if I actually did that, if I actually flunked all the A students out and gave all the F students scholarship, as that was my new rule, my A students happen to be a little bit smarter than my F students. So my A students are able to get lower grades than my F students because they never randomly make the mistake of guessing a correct answer. <laughs> my A students still get the lowest grades and they still get all the scholarships. And my F students are still flunked out. The theorem here again is uh, with taxes and redistribution, you cannot change the distribution of income with taxation. But what you can do is you can change the volume of income. Every revolution fought on planet Earth has been fought to change the distribution of income. Not one has succeeded. And yet every single major revolution has lost total amounts of income in the process. Are all of you with me? Do you, all of you follow that in the public policy? What I want to do now is go to uh, my latest book, which I you saw you out there. No one bought any, by the way. <laughs> Damn lucky you're not my students. <laughs> just teasing, just teasing. Uh, what I want to do is go through one aspect of the book here. It's called Taxes Have Consequences. Uh, it just came out this last week. Uh, and uh, it's with co-authors Gene Sinkfield and Brian Dimitrovic. And what it is, it's the tax history of the United States. All right? The tax history of the U.S. from 1913 to the present. But, and I'm going to give you a flavor of a part of this book. Not all of it. It's about 480 pages, so it's really boring. Uh, but it's a great buy. Uh, just joking. <laughs> I don't make any money. <laughs> it goes to 501c3 anyway, so it doesn't matter. But, uh, but what, uh, what I did in this is from 1913 to the present, uh, they got the 16th Amendment, I think, was passed uh, and authorized at the end of, 2000, of 1912, and then Woodrow Wilson put in income tax the next day, not six months later, something like that, put in. And we have had an income tax in the U.S. for about 110 something years, all right? So if you look at that income tax, and let me, if I can, if you can put up the, on the screen, this is the first part of the income tax. Initially, in 1913, the income tax was paid by a very small group of people. About 358,000 people paid income taxes. That's out of an adult population of 62 million. And the highest tax rate at that time was 7%. You follow me? I'm looking at all of this from the perspective of Saez, Piketty, all the redistributionists, all of the Harvard professors, all of the Berkeley professors. I'm looking at there. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of the highest tax rate and the top 1% in the society. That's the perspective I'm looking at this. All right? In 1913, 14, and 15, that tax rate stayed at 7%. That tax base was about 358,000 people each year there. And then all of a sudden, bump, 19, uh, uh, 1916, 17, uh, they popped up the rate. Uh, by 1918, now just think of this. By 1918, they raised the highest marginal income tax rate to 77%. Do you see that? I mean, is that not crazy? That was 1918, they had a 70, 77% uh, after World War I. That would, the, the excuse was World War I, and they had a pandemic. After World War I, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, had agreed that we'd won the war, and he thought he'd give the taxpayers a break. So he dropped the highest tax rate from 77% down to 73%. No, no, seriously, he was very generous. He gave back there. and. Uh, that was uh, 1919, was 73 percent. We then had the election of 1920, a very interesting election, by the way. Uh, Woodrow Wilson got his hand-picked candidate uh, to run, uh, Governor Cox of Ohio, uh, who picked his running mate, who was his best friend, who was the Undersecretary of the Navy at the time, a guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Some of you may recognize that name. It's going to pop up again. Uh, they had the race in 1920. Uh, Roosevelt and, uh, and Cox wanted to keep those tax rates high to pay off the debt. 
uh, uh, Harding and Coolidge wanted to cut those tax rates back. Their, their slogan was a return to normalcy. And if you look at that return to normalcy, they wanted to lower tax rates back to where they had been prior to World War I. Uh, the Republicans, Harding and Coolidge, won by the largest percentage ever in U.S. history. They took office in uh, March of 1921. They started their tax cut legislation, which lasted for quite a while. It led, now, if you know they're going to cut tax rates next year, what do you do this year? You defer all the income you possibly can out of this year into next year, and you create a very deep recession, depression, which is exactly what happened with Kennedy. It's exactly what happened with Harding and Coolidge. It's exactly what happened with Ronald Reagan, to be honest with you. The delay of taxes causes a downturn in the economy. It happened. The Depression, recession hit in 1922. But after 1922, they then were able to get the tax rates way, way down to 25%. Now, if you look at that plot there, from 1913 to 1918 was a re 20, excuse me, 1913 to 1920, uh, 22 was a really tough period for the U.S. economy. From 1923 on, you had the boom in the U.S. like you've never seen. They lowered the tax rates down to 25%. It was called the Roaring Twenties. You had this huge expansion of the economy. It was un un unbelievable. In 1929, uh, they put in something called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff. Uh, which was put in, and uh, really it was known to be coming in, in uh, October of 1929. From October for the next three months till the end of the year, the stock market fell by 35 I percent. Mean, you look at today's markets, <laughs> that's a lot of fall. By the way, by the time it finished falling, it was down to 5 percent of its previous level. It's incredible. We had the huge start of the crash of the Great Depression. In 1930, uh, you found that Nothing happened in 30. The market still kept crashing. It wasn't until 1931 that revenues ran really short. They then were delayed a year before you got the revenues. Uh, looking at the revenue shortfall, Herbert Hoover, uh, President of the United States, decided to raise taxes to, uh, to uh, bulwark the U.S. Uh, financial situation. So he, on January 1, 1932, uh, Hoover and the Congress raised the highest, in the middle of a depression, raised the highest marginal income tax rate from 25% to 63%, is that a good enough jump for you? you? You okay with that one? They raised ever their tax. If it flew, they taxed it. If it slept, they taxed it. If it crawled, they taxed it. If it dug holes, they taxed it. They didn't miss any tax on any of these things. And as you can see, in 1932, the crash went right to the bottom. Uh, Hoover lost the election to Roosevelt. Roosevelt took office in 1933. The first thing he did in 1933, March, is when they took office back then. First thing he did, was he declared private ownership of gold illegal in the United States. And he confiscated all privately held gold at $20.67 an ounce. Six months later, he devalued the dollar to $35 an ounce. It was the first major wealth tax that has been put in the United States of really incredible proportions. He did not raise rates, and the Depression kept going. Uh, by 1937, he'd raised the highest marginal income tax up to 79% raising taxes on everything else, but the inheritance tax went up to 90%. I mean, it was incredible what happened there. By 1944, the highest marginal income tax rate was 94%. I mean, just think of it. Every dollar you earned, you were allowed to keep six cents. That's it. I mean, it is amazing. After the war, we won the war. Uh, after the war, Truman, uh, the Congress passed tax cuts three times. Uh, all three times, Truman vetoed the tax cuts. Uh, the third veto that he put in was overridden by Congress. And we got, as you can see, there's the minor tax rates there. See it between 1943 and 1950? It dropped. But that led with a huge reduction in defense spending, led to a boom in the U.S. economy. And then Eisenhower came into office. But just before he came into office, uh, Truman was able to re-hike all the income tax rates to act up to 91 percent because of the Korean War. And we had that long period of, of really very, very high tax rates. Uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, uh, we had there the whole period there. You had a crash there. You had uh, the Kennedy period from 61 to 60, John F. Kennedy. He cut the highest tax rate from 91 percent to 70 percent. I mean, we had all sorts of things under Kennedy were done. He had the investment tax credit put in, accelerated depreciation, uh, cut the corporate rate from 52 to 48 percent incredible prosperity. Then you see the, the four stooges after him, 
leading the, again to a very slow economy. Finally, you get, oh, excuse me. Oh, no, joke, 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 joke. 1980, the skies parted, the clouds parted. Uh, they were, the, <laughs> they, the, by the way, the four stooges were Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter. It was the large, largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. It was really incredibly bad. And we've had some really bad ones over the years. I mean, the, uh, but in 1980, the clouds parted, the sun shone forth in the fields, the fields turned green, the animals multiplied, the trees blossomed, bore fruit, uh, children danced in the streets, and Ronald Reagan took office. <laughs> oh, be still. I was going to say I need what, but no, I'm just using static. Uh, the, uh, and we got the tax cuts down. I mean, let me tell you what we did to tax cuts during that period. When Reagan took office, the highest marginal income tax rate was 70%. He took it down to 28%. Is that a good enough cut for you? Uh, he put in, he cut the corporate tax from 46% to 34%. Uh, he took 11 tax brackets and made two tax brackets. I mean, just in the split second here with you, the 86 Tax Act cut the highest marginal income tax rate from 50% to 28%, raised the lowest tax rate from 12.5% to 15%, got rid of all tax brackets except for 28 and 15, cut the corporate rate from 46 to 34%. Can any of you imagine a bill like that today? No, there's not a Republican to vote for. Guess the vote in the Senate in 1986. 97 to 3. Every, three senators voted against it. Uh, uh, the little bow tied one in uh, uh, in Michigan. Uh, we had eleven in uh, uh, we had eleven in, um, in, in excuse me Illinois, and then uh, Michigan eleven, and then Merkley in Montana were the three who voted against it. I mean, Hetty Kennedy voted for it. Tall and pink, Bill Bradley he voted for it. Chuck Schumer voted for it. Nancy Pelosi voted for it as a Houseman. I mean. Uh, uh, you look at all of them have voted for it. Uh, oh, and what was the name of that senator from uh, Delaware who, uh, what was his name? <laughs> Joe Biden voted for it. Go back and look at his press release on this bill and how he said it was the best thing he's ever done. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Well, if you go through this whole period, the, the first thing you find out about taxes, whenever you've raised tax rates on the rich, the economy has gone into the doldrums. Whenever you've lowered tax rates on the rich, the economy outperforms, period. Clear, consistent data there. Can I get the next one, if I can? This is the Piketty-Saez one on redistribution. You, you know Thomas Piketty, you know Saez, all of those. They argue that whenever you raise tax rates on the rich, the share of income to the top 1% goes down. And whenever you lower tax rates on the rich, the share of income from the top 1% goes up. And on that observation, they are exactly correct. Every single time we've raised the highest tax rate on the rich, income inequality has declined. Every time we've lowered tax rates on the rich, income inequality has expanded. Every single time. But that's not the end of the story, people. It's how does income inequality decline and how does income inequality rise? When you raise tax rates on the rich, it is very true that the rich earn less and what they do earn, they shelter. That's really true. But it is not true that when you raise tax rates on the rich, the poor benefit from the richest decline in income. In fact, just the opposite is true. The rich income declines, reported income declines a lot, but the incomes of the lowest echelons of the U.S. economy also decline, but they decline by smaller amounts, just like you'd expect from the theorem on redistribution, period. Every time we've raised income, ta income taxes on the rich, the poor have been made worse off. The Great Depression, World War II. World War II after-tax incomes were less than they had been 75, 80 years earlier, the average wages. I mean, it's just incredible. You can see this very clearly. So whenever you've raised tax rates in the rich, 
It is true, income inequality declines because both groups decline dramatically. The rich just decline by more than the poor do. You follow me there? Next one, if I can. And the, by the way, I just want you to understand that we have every single tax return. This is not a sampling property. We have every single tax return kept by the IRS. These are the data. You know, I don't mind uh, people having differences of opinion. In fact, I, I really sort of relish people having differences of opinions. But while you're allowed to have a difference of opinion, you're not allowed to have your own facts. And when you look at this, these are the facts from the U.S. tax return data, period. If you look at this, every time we've raised taxes on the rich, tax revenues from the top 1% have declined. Every time we've lowered tax rates on the rich, tax revenues from the rich have increased. Every single, look at that plot there. Those are the actual data. Anyone who tells you they're gonna get more revenues by raising taxes on the rich does not know the facts of the income tax history of the United States period. They just don't. Let me go to the next chart if I can here as well. This is the share of total taxes paid by the top 1% as a share of GDP and by the bottom 95% as a share of GDP. What you can see here is when you raise tax rates on the rich, the taxes just hover around 1% and they just hover that way all along. But when you raise tax rates on the rich, what happens is those taxes are pushed further and further down onto lower income groups and total tax revenues collected from the bottom 95% as a share of GDP go way, way up. When we finally cut tax rates in 1981, 82, 83, all of a sudden you see tax revenues from the rich rising dramatically. See that on the end there? And you can see tax revenues from the bottom 95% as a share of GDP declining. It's exactly what happens in the system. So number one, whenever you raise tax rates in the rich, literally the economy goes into the doldrums. Number two, whenever you raise tax rates in the rich, income inequality declines because both groups suffer but the rich suffer a little bit more than the poor. And lastly, whenever you raise tax rates on the rich, uh, you find that the uh, revenues from the rich uh, go down. And whenever you lower them on the rich, and then you look at the total burden of taxes here on that. I want to leave that with you there because this is exactly what actually happens when you look at the data. And again, I want to stress this is 100% of all tax returns. Uh, this is the data here. In fact, I use the Saez Piketty data uh, for these calculations here as well as the IRS data. The differences are really irrelevant, minor differences in that. Do all of you understand that in this theorem there? When you look at legislation, when you look at people who want to raise tax rates in the rich, just remember the facts of what happens historically when that occurs. Think of what happens, what states, what states do the best prospering. And I just want to point this out. These are the data. When you look at macroeconomics, and I'm going to end here. When you look at macroeconomics, there are five areas or five pillars of prosperity. And I, I don't want to be like your professors, at, like the professors at Oklahoma State University. You know, you all know them? You know the ones I mean? Do you know why they have round shoulders and a flat forehead? You ask them a question and they go, you tell them the answer and they go, Just easy, just easy. The, uh, when you look at macroeconomics, there are five pillars of prosperity, and I want to go through them with you and then throw it open to questions. Number one, taxes. What you want to have in taxes is the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. So you provide people with the least incentives to evade, avoid, or otherwise not report taxable income. And you have the broadest tax base, so you provide people with the least places where they can put their income in order to avoid paying taxes. The North Star of taxation is the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. Anything that moves you in that direction is good. Anything that moves you away from that direction is bad. I did Jerry Brown's flat tax when he ran for president of the United States in 1992. Uh, Demo you, you probably know, do they know who Jerry Brown is? The Democratic governor from California? Governor Moonbeam, uh, greatest. By the way, my dear, one of my dearest friends. We got rid of all federal taxes. 
all of them, the personal income tax, the corporate tax, payroll tax, both employer and employee, Medicare, Medicaid taxes, excise taxes, tariffs. We got rid of all federal taxes with the exception of sin taxes. And the reason we kept sin taxes is because their purpose is not so much to raise revenues as it is to change behavior. I, I used to jokingly say, we Americans don't like drunk people smoking while we shoot each other. <laughs> Sorry about that. The, but you want, you know, there, we get the lowest possible tax rate on the broadest possible tax base. Number two, pillar number two, uh, you know, spending restraint. Now, everyone knows we need government spending. Everyone does. You know, what you should do is all taxes are bad. So what you want to do is collect your taxes in the least damaging fashion possible. And you want, what you want government to do is spend that money in the most beneficial fashion possible. And when the damage done by the last dollar of taxes collected is a little bit less than the benefit done from the last dollar spent, you stop already. That's the perfect size for government. Any government less than that should be increased, and any government larger than that should be brought down. Low rate, broad-based, flat tax, spending restraint. Third pillar sound money. There's almost nothing that can bring an economy to its knees quicker than high inflation and high interest rates. Almost nothing. When we took office on January 20th, 1981, the prime interest rate in this wonderful country of yours was 21.5%. With Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan, Volcker tightening money and Reagan expanding the number of goods, we brought inflation down like a stone and it came way, way down there. You know, sound money is critical. If you look at what's happening today with inflation, you can see exactly how the Fed is messing things up and how the fiscal policy is keeping us from having more goods. It's the exact opposite policies you should have. Low rate, broad-based, flat tax, spending restraints, sound money. Fourth, minimal regulations. Now, we all know we need regulations. I mean, we all know, and I was trying to explain to Sandeep, uh, given his background, you can't drive on the left-hand side of the road anymore. Just joking. Uh, you know, you need regulations. You can't drive on the left-hand side of the road one day and the right-hand side of the road. You need regulations. But what you want to make sure is that the consequences of those regulations don't be, go beyond the, the situation at hand and cause a lot of collateral damage. You want to have limited uh, regulations uh, to make sure you don't have a lot of collateral damage. And I could go through tons and tons of examples with you. The one example I can think of is, is hospital transparency today, which is just a tragedy on this country, that we don't see prices we can't know, and the hospital sector is getting worse and worse, and the life expectancy of the U.S. is getting lower and lower relative to the rest of the world, and the costs are increasing more and more relative to the rest of the world because of the regulatory structure of, of hospitals and healthcare providers. You know, Low rate, broad based, flat tax, spending restraint, sound money, minimal regulations, and lastly, which is probably going to upset some, free trade. There are some things we produce better than foreigners, and there are some things foreigners produce better than we do. We and they would be foolish in the extreme if we didn't sell them those products we make better than they do in exchange for those products they make better than we do. That's trade. And you should not use trade as a political weapon, period. Now, I'm not suggesting we should sell nuclear weapons to North Korea. I'm not suggesting that. But what I am saying is that we should trade with all countries, period, in a free trade fashion. And the reason I say that is when you trade with people, you tend to like them. How many of you like people who pay you money? Everyone does. Everyone loves their customers. And what you need to do is make sure you trade with those countries and make sure that the relationship between our country and theirs is a good, positive one of free trade, of mutual improvement in economic situations. Literally. That means Russia. That means China. That means Iran. That means all of these countries. There is nothing more hostilizing to people than prohibitions on trade. Uh, 50 years from now, believe me when I tell you, China will be here on this earth. 50 years from now, we'll be here on this earth. It's much better that we become friends and business partners with each other 
than arch enemies going on and on and on. Free trade eliminates or reduces dramatically the incidence of war, of hostilities, et cetera. Five pillars, low rate, broad based flat tax, spending restraint, sound money, minimal regulations, free trade, and then get the heck out of the way and let the country solve its issues. I want to just stop here, uh, but what, what I do want to say is I'll, I'll like to throw it open, but I'm, I'll tell you the story about this straight-laced older gentleman, uh, lawyer, uh, worked in this law firm every day. He finished work at 5 o'clock. He'd go home to his wife. Uh, they'd meet, she'd meet him at the door. He'd go in, boom. Just the most straight-laced, great guy. One day after 30 years in the law firm, one of his colleagues talked him, in, talked him into going out for a drink before he went home. Well, one drink led to two drinks, led to three drinks, led to four drinks, and then all of a sudden he looked up at his watch and he realized he was three hours late getting home. He had not called his wife. He was a little bit in the bag, and so what he did was he wrote down some notes, the excuse he would tell his wife. He walked in, she, he grabbed the door handle, she pulled the door open, he flipped over, fell flat in his back, looked straight up, and she was scowling down at him like this, and he said, darling, I've decided to dispense with my prepared statement and answer questions from the floor. Thank you. We have time for some questions from the floor for Dr. Laffer, please. Dr. Laffer, um, I know you've been a flat tax proponent for, what, over 50 years. And I think another benefit of flat tax would be if you reduce the political complexity of tax laws, that you may reduce the distortion of allocation of resources. And I think that would, if you had more efficient allocation of resources, you'd have more productivity. Yeah. Does, that, does that sound logical? Yeah, it's perfectly logical. Let me tell you how you really get a flat tax, if I can. You know, the real simple thing is politicians are always going to make money. It's, it's the nature of things, if I may say it that way. They're always going to make money. The question is, how do they make the money? And that's the issue. Now, if you look at uh, politicians today, my solution for politicians is put them on commission. <laughs> well, let's imagine you have two companies, company A and company B, okay? Exactly identical companies with one difference. Company A, the officers and directors have high salaries, own no stock, and have no stock options. Company B, the officers and directors have low salaries, have a lot of stock, and have a lot of stock options. Which one of those two companies would you like to invest in? You, you with me on that? I mean, it's incentives that matter. What you want is an alignment of incentives. I mean, do you remember that lovely student, Mr. Smith goes to Washington? Jimmy Stewart gets up there, filled with, imbued with social conscience and love of mankind in this country. He goes to Washington, he works his tail off day and night, blah, 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 blah. The unemployment rate falls, the inflation rate falls. I mean, the stock market soars, the enemies of America are pushed offshore, and everything is beautiful. What happens to Jimmy Stewart's salary? If that happens, nothing. Now imagine his evil twin becomes a congressman and goes to Washington. And he goes, ha, 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 ha. And now he destroys it. The inflation rate goes way up. The unemployment rate goes way up. The stock market crashes. The enemies of America are on the shores. And the unemployment, I mean, it's just a disaster. What happens to that congressperson's salary? Nothing. The problem is, these people are spending other people's money. And it's really fun. What we should do is put them on commission. And very seriously, imagine this. The economy grows at 3%. Hey, you get all your salaries, you're fine. Good for you. The economy grows at 4%. Woohoo! Uh, we'll double your salary. Economy grows at 5%. We'll triple your salary. Economy grows at 2%. Eh, not so much. No salary this year. The economy grows at 1%. They owe us their salary back. Their behavior would change dramatically. What we really need to do in this country is to develop a system of compensation for politicians that so their incentives are exactly aligned with ours. Believe me, that's the right way. And that, along with the flat tax,
would move us mountains. Do all of you follow me? Incentives need to be used everywhere. People like doing things they find attractive, and they're repelled by things they find unattractive. And public policy can change the attractiveness of activities, believe me. Yes. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for speaking here with us. I just had a quick question. You spoke of the importance, uh, as negative as taxes might be, you spoke of the importance of them, regardless of, of the negative um, things that they come with. Uh, and you, like you said, you're a proponent of the flat, flat tax rate. Is it, how do you go about finding that? And once you do, is that set, or is that able to move throughout the, to, throughout the years? No, what you, what you do with a flat tax is you initially, the, what I did with Jerry Brown, was the initial flat tax, we made it so that it was a little bit positive revenue. It wasn't revenue neutral, it was a little bit positive neutral, static, which means with no Laffer curve effect or anything like that, we would collect a little bit more. We calculate all federal taxes on the basis that I described to you, the, the personal unadjusted gross income and also the, uh, the flat tax on income, totally, okay. We calculated it came out 11.8%. Uh, I rounded it up to 12%, Jerry rounded it up to 13% for two reasons. Number one, you really wanna make sure you eliminate and eliminate all possibility of having a huge shortfall of revenue for public spender purposes. In states for education, there's no way a governor or a legislature in a state could survive a huge shortfall in revenue for education. That just, so you wanna make sure the first year you make sure you collect enough revenue and you get the, then as the revenues come in, you use the surplus funds to lower the rate further and further and further. It's really a beautiful system there because let's imagine, uh, and I'm not a climatologist, I don't know, and Al Gore is one of my dearest friends. I did the whole blurb on his book, The Future. Uh, he's really into the global climate, as you probably know, Al Gore is, and I I'm not. But, you know, we both agreed on one thing. I, I don't know whether it's global warming or not, but he wanted, and I, I would go along with it with no problem, putting on a carbon tax if at the same time we reduce the income tax uh, by the same exact amount. I would take a carbon tax over an income tax every day of the week and twice on Sundays. So when you find things like, 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 like uh, with huge uh, externalities, like they believe happens with carbon in the atmosphere, and they may be right, I, I just don't know. But if there are, that's a perfect way of having a syntax put into place and then reducing the income tax dollar for dollar to make sure it doesn't have a total. The reason I'm so against the carbon tax is if it was a standalone, it would kill the economy. It would just destroy the economy. But if you offset it with an income tax, it would not kill the economy. And uh, it, there's a lot of literature on this. And if any of you are interested, I'd be glad to send you my paper on this and where I go through with Al Gore's stuff all the way on that. But that's why a flat tax, I think. And then as the surpluses come in, and they will come in, when you do that little bit static revenue uh, surplus, believe me, the economy's gonna soar. And you're gonna get a lot more. Then you just use all those proceeds to just reduce the rate. And you come back down to the religious rate, which is tithing, which is 10%. And then once, you, I'm just joking with you. <laughs> you know, Moses knew what he was doing. <laughs> but you follow me? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, I just came from a political science lecture before this. And speaking of incentives, um, we had good trade relations with China for decades, but now it seems that through the good trade, trade relations, we've increased their ability to cause pain to others, like in the weaker populations, and then also increased the risk of war nationwide. So what do you say to people who would say, we've taken the wrong tack in good trade relations? I, I would say they're wrong on that, on trade. Uh, really close trading partners rarely fight with each other. Uh, countries that have invested heavily in other countries and have a lot of capital investment in those countries, they're loath to bomb their own capital in the other countries, just for the record. Uh, I happen to be the first American in modern times to go to China. I went in 1970 with George Schultz and John Ehrlichman in Air Force Two. We did the pre-Kissinger trip for China. And you know, I'm from Ohio. You can probably tell I'm from a privileged family. And you can probably tell I'm, I was not friendly towards China, uh, you know, the, the Korean War and all that. And so I went there convinced I was gonna hate them. And, and I fell in love with China instantaneously. This is one of the most free enterprise positive countries on the trade level I've ever seen in my life. 
you know, not trading with them is hurting us enormously. It does hurt them as well, but what it really does is it causes our two countries to be enemies in the world rather than trying to be friends and work things out. Now, that I don't think uh, intellectual property uh, should be stolen. But again, remember, intellectual property is stolen by a company, not by a country. And intellectual property stealing from one American firm to another American firm should be illegal. One uh, intellectual property stolen from a Chinese firm by another Chinese firm should be illegal. And it should also be illegal to do it from Chinese to American or American to Chinese. We need very strict free trade and regulate regulations on stealing, but frankly, we need to have open training with all countries. I mean, just imagine yourself in their shoes right now or in Russia's shoes or in Iran's shoes. I'm not saying any of those countries aren't anything but evil on that. But trading with them will make them less evil, not more evil. And it really will, guys. Uh, free trade is really one of the greatest elixirs of peace that the world has ever seen. Um, Dr. Laffer, I understand how free trade on a global level makes us all more prosperous, but it also has created some losers. And those losses tend to be localized and they create local issues, social issues. How would you say we should compensate those losers? Should we do that at all? Yeah. Let me just say that the losers should be treated as losers no matter what causes them to lose. If it's tree free trade that does it, if it's technological progress that does it, when you have a community that has suffered a loss, we should have a plan for dealing with those losers, as you call them. And that should be independent of whether they're losers because of free trade or anything else. And that should be adjustment assistance, allowing them to get education to go to other, that's what we should do. But I would not single that out as free trade losers. It's from any type of thing that causes that group to be losers. And there are a lot of those that are there because of technological progress. So please, I, I, I would prefer you not to make it specific. Now, let me give you an example. You go to Michigan, Indiana, or Ohio, or my home state, and they're telling me that the Chinese and these other countries have all stolen the auto, auto industry. They all say that. I, I gave you the story of, of Michigan, 5.2% down to 2.7%. Look at Ohio, same thing, by the way. Ohio has collapsed as much as Michigan does. Indiana has been hammered to death, they've all lost their auto industries in all three of those states, and they all claim it's free trade. I wonder why all those industries are now located in Tennessee, and they are. We have one of the biggest industries there in auto industries in Tennessee because we run good state economic policies with the lowest tax state in the nation, and we get all of these companies coming in. It's not free trade that caused Michigan its problems. It's Michigan that has caused Michigan its problems. And they've got to solve those problems internally if they're going to solve it. Now, when you have a community that suffers losses, we all should try to do the best adjustment assistance we possibly can, irrespective of the source of what caused them to be losers. You, you follow me? Please. Uh, two related tax questions. First of all, sales tax, right, right oh. here. <laughs> Yeah, sales tax versus a flat tax, your views on that. And then secondly, Liz Truss's plan to cut taxes. I know she's they kind of reversed it in the very top rates, but what you think the uh, likely long-term impact would be for Great Britain? Let, let me talk. I, I've got just got a paper, uh, article out today in the Daily Mail in, in London, by the way, which is on this topic as well. Uh, and in the Sunday Times, four days ago, I had another one in there, big deal, a big one there in that as well. I'm really into the British politics and economics and have been since Lady Thatcher. As you know, I worked with her there. Uh, first place that 40p, 40% is a, an ultra low tax rate. You know, from 1988, I think it was, until 2010, the highest tax rate in Britain was 40%. They were almost a quarter of a century and it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, when Gordon Brown raised the highest tax rate from 40% to 50%, uh, which he did, they had up a commission two years later, they set up a commission under Chancellor of the Exchequer, Osborne, uh, when David Cameron was the Prime Minister, they did, to study the effects of the Gordon Brown tax increase. Well, they had this big report, which you can get at any time, it's called Customs and Taxes, the report, and the report comes out that it had distortions, cost revenues, cost Britain, it's competitiveness, everything. It was the biggest negative report on raising the tax ever, 
that they didn't get the revenues. They caused people to leave the country. They caused huge distortions and massive amounts of tax sheltering in the process. And the people who left not only took their high incomes with them, they took all the other incomes. They took all their sales tax with them, all their property tax. Everything else went with them as well. So, you know, that's what I would say on the, on the taxes there on, on Britain, uh, on that. And uh, if you want, anyone would like my paper on, on British, what happened with Kwasi Kwatong, who's a fairly good friend of mine. I don't know Liz Trust, but I would be more than happy to share that paper with any of you. And the sales tax. Oh, and the sales tax. You know, the, on the sales tax is a good broad-based flat tax if it's got no exemptions, deductions, exclusions, omissions, or any of that stuff. Now, uh, I was just up in Wisconsin with uh, uh, John Mako, who's head of the Ways and Means, and if you looked at that, their exemptions are equal to the amount of taxes they collect. Over half the taxes they should collect with their sales tax, they don't collect because of all these exclusions, exemptions. Uh, if you got rid of those exemptions, what I call rationalize the tax code, you could reduce their sales tax rate by half, expand the tax base with none of those exemptions, exclusions, et cetera, and still collect the same amount of revenue. In fact, you collect more revenue because of the more efficient system. Now, Oregon uh, has decided to eliminate its sales tax and use an income tax. Uh, some of the states have used a sales tax, like Tennessee, and not an income tax. Those are all open choices. But still, whichever ones you choose, you want to have at the lowest rate and the broadest base whichever one you do. And those are real serious political questions, but <coughs> you want to be very careful on all the types of loopholes you put into your tax systems because they really, really distort the whole thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tennessee's number one, by the way. Just thought I'd mention it. It's still bad. Let, let me, can I give you one example and then just stop? Let me just give you one example. I did a big thing for, um, uh, uh, for, for, for Missouri um, and um, came across this. In Missouri today, and this is five years ago, four years ago. In Missouri, four years ago, there were 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions. Well, let me say that again. There were 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions in Missouri that had a separate sales tax. All right? You, you follow me on that? Missouri's population is a total of 6 million. So that means each sales tax jurisdiction on average has 3,000 people. Some are much larger and some are much smaller. This is true. Each of those sales tax jurisdictions in Missouri has upwards of eight separate entities authorized to separately impose a sales tax. Now, the average in Missouri is 4.7. So there are 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions averaging 3,000 people per sales tax jurisdiction. There are upwards of eight separate taxing authorities within each sales tax jurisdiction. Average was 4.7. You, you with me on that? Uh, not only that, but when you look at products, there are 25 separate sales tax schedules related to individual products. There's groceries in the grocery store, there's groceries in a restaurant, you know, there are all these different ones, medicines, there, uh, diesel fuel, I mean, I could go through blah, 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 all these, 25 separate schedules, depending upon the product, uh, 2,339 separate sales tax jurisdictions, upwards of eight separate authorities, 4.7 being the average, and there are on purchasers three separate categories of sales tax purchasers that have separate sales tax schedules like 501c3s, which you are. You don't have to pay a sales tax in this. All right, All right. You, you got this complication. I'm sitting there having lunch with Mike Parsons, who's the governor and in, in the mansion, and I'm trying to explain this to him. And he's a cattle farmer from western Michigan, uh, Missouri. He's a great guy, he's really lovely. But he's got a cattle farm, small cattle farm there. And as I go through all of these things, he goes, he had no idea. None of those people in the legislature have a clue as to what's going on there. Then, in the infinite wisdom of the real estate entity there, they put through a constitutional amendment of five years ago, which locked all of those schedules into the Constitution. Now, you want to know what problems are. Those are the real problems. I, there are 105 separate property taxes in Louisville, Jefferson County alone. Ohio has 1,440 separate income taxes. 
separate ones. Each county has one, each city has one, each, each special education district has one. But, but, but I mean, I, I got to tell you that when you want to look at what type of tax to use, I, I would not go on sales tax or income tax or property taxes or whatever. What I would do is look at the rationalization. What you want is the lowest rate on the broadest base. Once you've rationalized the tax codes, then you can sit there and make very serious discussions about which tax you prefer to use or another. But a sales tax is not much more than a VAT, and a VAT is a very good a tax in a system if it's rationalized. You, you all follow me there? I'll do one more if I can. I, I'll do any my yeah, number. Two quick ones. I'll do as many as you want. I was curious what your perspective on uh, independence of nations and how does that affect like the global economy? Um, what is the economics behind that? Yeah. But you, you can probably guess what my view is on independence of nations. In the, OEC, in the European Union, I think there are 23 members of the European Union and each one gets to host the conference every six months. and. Uh, I don't know why, but the keynote, Slovakia chose me to be the keynote in Bratislava. And so you land in Vienna, and then you drive the highway there to go into Bratislava. I, I love it. I, that's my type of country there, the whole place. And uh, on the keynote, I said, you know, Adam Smith talked about competition. You all know that. Many producers, many consumers, the products there, the marginal rate of substitution is the price, and labor and leisure is the wage, and blah, 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 all the perfect atomistic solutions there, the perfect, perfect company. And I, no one, at least I don't disagree with that model at all. But competition is more necessary with governments than it is with any industry in the world. So my suggestion to them was that any union of countries like the EU is a blasphemy and it just allows gov whenever governments coll collude together, it's always to exploit the electorate. It, it is always to exploit the electorate. So my view was that I thought the European Union to dissolve into its 23 countries and all of them compete on what their tax policies are, what their, and see which one does well. And one does well, the others will emulate. If one does badly, woohoo, push them out the window. But you know, there's nothing more important than government competition and free trade and free movement movement of capital. The coolest thing about this country of ours, and the coolest thing is, is in our constitution, we have the, uh, we have the clause, the Commerce Clause, which says that no state can, com can prohibit or discriminate against any products coming from other states. They must be, and then in the, I forget what it's called, the Emoluments Clause, that no state is allowed to discriminate against any American uh, who choose to live anywhere as long as that person is willing to live with the laws and customs of that place. So we have a perfect free trade world here. That the reason I gave you that story about the 11 states that introduced the income tax is because this is more free trade than any. We have the same language, the same federal government, the same currency. We are a free trade, and you know these states are allowed to do all sorts of stuff. Learn from them. Learn from them and do the right thing. Don't try to override them. If all these states cooperated with each other and all of them put in a 10% income tax, you know, what they are doing is colluding against the electorate. And that is exactly what happens with the EU. My view is the EU should not exist. And each of these countries should. Now, there could be a couple here, there that should be together. And a currency union is very different than a, than a fiscal policy union. But in my mind, the more, the merrier. Does that answer your question? Uh, by the way, I got, uh, I got two or three claps and standing booing. <laughs> but they were all government bureaucrats. To hell with them. No, I'm just joking. Everyone, I think yeah, we're I, at our time, so please I, I, uh, join I'm us fine. in. Uh, if you want to go, I'll go. Well, go. we'll we'll call the formal proceedings to a close. But if people want to stick around for a few minutes, Dr. Laffer is happy to hang around and answer questions. Don't forget, there's a book table outside, and I suspect if you purchase a book today, there's a good chance you could get it autographed by the author. So please join us in thanking Dr. Laffer for coming to Baylor.